Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is a beloved, highly acclaimed actor who's brought us many memorable performances throughout his four decade plus career. On the big screen, he got a Golden Globe Award nomination in 1979 for New Star of the Year for his performance opposite George C. Scott in Movie Movie. He went on to star in many movies, including Clash of the Titans, Making Love, Under Investigation, Shoot or Be Shot, Immigrant, The Fourth Noble Truth, The Unattainable Story, No Alternative, and most recently, 80 for Brady. And on TV, in addition to his performances as Reese Hardin on Movie Stars, Aaron Eccles on Veronica Mars, Professor Chandler on Army Wives, Walter on Glee, Jonathan Dalton on Graves, and Cortland Mayfair on Mayfair Witches, he will forever be remembered for his portrayals of Ned Lishman on Shameless, Jim Cutler on Mad Men, for which he got an Emmy nomination for Outstanding Guest Actor in a Drama Series, and of course, Michael Kuzak on LA Law, for which he received three Golden Globe Award nominations for Best Performance by an Actor in a Television Drama Series. And in 1987, People Magazine named him the sexiest man alive. On the stage, he's appeared on Broadway in Clifford Odette's Awake and Sing and Tennessee Williams' Summer and Smoke. And he starred in numerous Shakespeare plays, earning a Helen Hayes Award nomination for his performance as Henry V at the renowned Shakespeare Theatre Company in Washington. In 2010, he released a memoir entitled Full Frontal Nudity, The Making of an Accidental Actor, which is a highly entertaining account of his rather unusual and at times raucous adventures as a young student before his film and television career began. He graduated from Yale with degrees in drama and psychology and subsequently received a Master of Fine Arts in acting from the American Conservatory Theatre in San Francisco. And if all of that weren't enough, our guest is also the co-founder of TAE Technologies, which is at the leading edge of developing anatronic fusion power, which is a clean, safe, and inexpensive way of providing electricity to the world. I'm delighted to welcome the one and only Harry Hamlin to our show. Harry, thank you so much for being here. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, and that was a. It sounded pretty impressive. <laughs> but, well, it uh, is impressive. You, you, and, and I'll tell you something else that's impressive. Your family background, your paternal grandfather, Chauncey Hamlin, founded the Buffalo Museum of Science and was president of the American Association of Museums, and he created the International Council of Museums. And your father, Chauncey Hamlin Jr., was an aeronautical engineer who worked with Dr. Werner von Braun in designing the Saturn V rocket. So with that pedigree, what was your family's reaction when you told them you wanted to be an actor? Well, you can imagine, since there was no nobody artistic in my side of the family, my father, like you said, was an engineer. And when I when I told them I wanted to be an actor, they basically lost their mind. And when I when I was going to go to acting school, I was offered a, a scholarship by William Ball to go to the American Conservatory Theater after I finished Yale. And the day that I was going to drive up to start my adventure in acting, they removed the distributor cap, which is basically the heart of the, the vehicle from my car and hit it so that I couldn't drive. Uh, and it was, it's the only time in my life that I intentionally bounced a check. I wrote a check to Pacific Southwest Airlines for $25, but I knew I didn't have any money in my account uh, at the airport and, and flew to San Francisco where I depended upon the kindness of strangers for the first few months because my parents basically disinherited me at that point. Yeah, well, you proved them wrong. You know what I think is a really cool coincidence is that your dad designed the starting mechanism for the rocket that carried Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the moon. And then many years later, you worked with Buzz Aldrin on developing anatronic power. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's, yeah it is quite a coincidence. But, you know, he, uh, my father did, he designed the starting mechanism for, for the Jupiter rocket. The Jupiter, because he was head of the Jupiter program in our space program, I think before it was even NASA. And that that rocket engine then evolved over time into the F-1, which was the rocket engine that took the astronauts to the moon. But yeah, it was weird that, uh, and just a total coincidence that years later, uh, I asked Buzz to join the uh, 
the board of directors of this company that I was putting together. While we're on the subject of your parents, Harry, I can't resist asking you about the fact that your parents gave you a subscription to Playboy magazine when you were only 11 years old. Looking back as a parent yourself, what do you make of that? <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a couple of questions that I always wanted to ask them before they left the planet. And that was one of them. And I, I just never got around to asking them why they did that. I'm sure they had a good reason for it. Perhaps they wanted to push me in a certain direction. I don't know. Whatever they might have thought direction I was going in, I was very grateful that they, you know, used that mechanism, whatever it was, because I was definitely uh, heterosexual. And yeah, it was it was kind of exciting to have a five-year, by the way, five-year subscription to Playboy. And when it was over, I, I don't think I've ever looked at another Playboy again until my wife did it a couple of times. So until Lisa did it. Now, you came of age during the hippie movement of the late 60s and early 70s. And you must have been a bit of a rebel because in the summer of 1971, while you were at Berkeley, you were offered a role in three productions by the Marin Shakespeare Festival. But you turned them down to start a counterculture theater group called the Peoples of Berkeley Workshops and Improvisational Group. Given your well-known love of Shakespeare, did you ever regret that decision? Only, only that it was the Marin Shakespeare Festival and, and Robin Williams was hired that season to play in it as well. Of course, we I didn't know. I would have met Robin there. We, we probably would have become friends uh, very early on in our career. So the only thing I regret about it is that, you know, yeah, I would have been on stage with Robin Williams when I was, you know, just barely out of, out of being a teenager. But uh, we ended up doing a, a nude production of Peer Gint that summer. It was Pobwig was that we called it, the People's of Berkeley Workshops and Improvisational Group. And we did a, um, yeah, an unclothed version of, of Peer Gint in a church. And uh, these dowagers would come in with their fur coats thinking they were going to see a great Ibsen play. And and yet they saw a bunch of hippies running around nude in this church. It was um, not one of my finest moments, put it that way. <laughs> I mentioned that you were a bit of a rebel. So I have to acknowledge that when you were president of your frat house at Berkeley, you got into trouble for allowing women to live at the frat house. And you refused to write a letter of apology to Governor Ronald Reagan. And then 16 years later, you were invited to the White House by President Reagan who was a big fan of L.A. law. Did you ever tell him that you were the one who caused all that controversy back at Berkeley? No, I didn't. <laughs> I could have, I suppose, you know, but there was a lot of water under the bridge at that point. And I'm not sure he would have remembered my name from the time when he asked me. Well, he asked the university when they found out that I had had girls living in the house. I was I was the least stoned person living in the house. So they made me the house manager, which meant I was president of the fraternity. Fraternities in those days weren't really, people weren't pledging them really. I mean, it was kind of a, they were persona non grata on campus and the houses were still there and they had to pay their rent. So we just had to rent the rooms out to whomever. And I couldn't fill it up with men. So the second floor was all girls. And then we had, a, everything was great until we had a fire in December of of my of 1971 i guess and, and and the fire department was plucking girls off the roof at three o'clock in the morning and wondering what was wrong with that picture because it was a fraternity house anyway and when reagan got wind of it he asked that that i i was president so i was responsible for it he asked that the university ask me not to re-enroll they couldn't kick me out because i hadn't broken any laws but they were very strict and and wanted me just not to come back. And I asked them if they wanted me to transfer. And they said, that would be great. I said, would you help me? They said, yes. And I said, well, how about Yale? So I ended up going to Yale. Well, when you were at Yale, you were in the American premiere of a play called Mad Dog Blues, written by an avant-garde young playwright by the name of Sam Shepard. That must okay. have been so exciting. Well, we didn't know that Sam Shepard was about to become one of our great playwrights. I mean, this was Sam, this is before Sam Shepard really kind of took off. It was 1973, I think. And we did it in a squash court, uh, converted into a theater. And it was very underground because it was underground. And yeah, it was a rock and roll play. I don't remember the premise exactly. 
but anyway, yeah, it was it was early on in Sam Shepard's career and very early on in my career. And I'm not sure how you dug that one up. Was that in the book? It was in your book. Yes. So, yeah. And then in 1976, you got to meet Tennessee Williams, and you actually asked him whether Marlon Brando's performance of Stanley Kowalski in A Streetcar Named Desire was what he intended. Did you ever get an answer from him? Sort of. And I, ironically, I'm, I've been, I have a copy of Streetcar Named Desire right here because of I, I discovered the house where he had had the poker party that that play was the play was based on. anyway that's another story but i did i asked tennessee williams yes if if he, marlon brando had played stanley kowalski the way he had intended and uh he just he just said he looked at me and said, well son he said uh why don't you go home and reread the play read it very closely and come back and tell me tomorrow what you think so i did in those days you couldn't go out and rent a movie and uh there were no you know rentable movies at that point so uh, i went back and i reread the play and and I, I went back the next day and he was sitting in the audience. We were he, rehearsing a play of his at ACT at the American Conservatory Theater. And I said, yes, Mr. Williams, I reread the play and I read it closely. And it seems to me that that Stanley Kowalski was born and raised in New Orleans. But I didn't pick that up in his performance. I didn't pick up that he was Southern and I didn't pick up that he was from New Orleans. And Tennessee Williams just looked at me and winked and he said, good boy. And that's all. There you go. Well, in your book, you wrote about some very interesting and, dare I say, Harry, quite scary close encounters with the criminal justice system when you were a <laughs> university student, both in America and in Mexico. Did you rely on any of those experiences when you were fleshing out the sensibilities of your character of Michael Kuzak on L.A. Law? Well, no, I never made a connection between those two things. I, I kind of put those episodes with the law behind me but yeah I, I did have a few scrapes with the law you know uh yeah it is what it is well you know that we're filming this show in canada i want to apologize to you on behalf of canadians for all the stress you've had at the border at least on one occasion i hope that got sorted out well it did ultimately but it did inspire me to write the book full frontal nudity when i was I had I was doing a show called um, Harper's Island, and but I was already living in Canada, so I flew from Toronto to Vancouver. And you know, when you when an actor flies into Canada to, to do a, a movie, an American actor, you got to get a work permit, and uh, you get that when you fly from one country to the other. But I was flying from within Canada, so I couldn't pick up the work per permit at the airport. We had to actually drive from the airport in Vancouver down to Washington, turn right around and come back across the border to pick up the work permit. And the, the young lady at the counter kept saying, it was kind of like, who's on first? Because, uh, you know, she said, what do you do? I said, I'm here to pick up my work permit for Har for Harper's Island. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing a show called Harper's Island. She said, well, where's Harper's Island? I said, well, I don't know that Harper's Island actually exists. And she said, how can you be working somewhere that doesn't exist? And I said, well, it's a TV show. And she said, what TV show? But where's Harper's Island? If it's called Harper's Island, there's got to be a Harper's Island somewhere. And I, anyway, it went around and around and around. And she finally got so exasperated with me that she that she went back and did a deep search and found out that I had been arrested like 45 years earlier for possession of marijuana. And I and by the way, I only had about this much marijuana. But at the time, if you were arrested for marijuana, they said you were you're a drug addict and all kinds of stuff. And I, anyway, she said she refused to let me into Canada. And I had I ended up having to do a year of criminal rehabilitation with the 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 consulate here in Los Angeles uh, in order to get uh, a, basically a paper of exoneration. The ironic thing was that pretty much the very week that I got that um, that exoneration, the consulate uh, called me up and asked me to be the keynote speaker at the Canada Day celebration at the consulate, which was kind of an odd thing, given the fact that I had been going through a year of rehabilitation. I must have been very rehabilitated. <laughs> and therein lies the quintessential contradiction of being Canadian. You now totally encapsulated <laughs> it. Now, Harry, one of the reasons I very much wanted to interview you is to tell you 
how important your performance in Making Love was to the gay men of my generation who had never seen any movie or TV show that portrayed us as, quote, normal people in a love story where gay people could be happy and fulfilled. I know it was very courageous of you to agree to play that role at that time, and I just want to thank you publicly for doing it. Well, uh, I have to say that I'm of, of all the things that I have done in in the film world, I'm most proud of that. It was before its time. I had way ahead of its time. But I can tell you that not a week goes by in my life, nor has for the last 40 some odd years, that someone doesn't come up to me and say the same thing and thank me for, for that performance and for doing the film. So from that perspective, I mean, to have that kind of a a positive effect on people's lives. I mean, how often does a human being have that opportunity? So I feel very grateful and blessed to have had that opportunity. Well, I read that because of the movie Making Love, your film career pretty much dried up for a while. And then a few years later, the movie Philadelphia came along and suddenly it became cool for straight actors to play gay characters. Did you know back in 1982 that you were making history? Not really. I had been offered a lot of films. You know, we'd, we'd come out of an actor's strike in 1980, and the roles that I was being offered after after filming Clash of the Titans, and people kind of knew what that movie was about, were, were all really weird kind of shoot 'em ups and, and, uh, and horror things. And uh, there was a movie about vampire bats that was being sold around town as some kind of pro Native American thing, but it was really about vampire bats invading a small town. So I, I, then I read this script and it was about something that was real. It was about something that was going on in, in our society at the time that no one really wanted to discuss or talk about. And this movie shed a certain amount of light on that element of our society. And so I thought, this is a real movie. This is about something real, not something phony or fake. And uh, that's why I did it. But I did not know that it would ultimately have the effect that it had. Now, you've shown incredible versatility in the roles you've played over the years. Is there any one role that most closely resembles the real Harry Hamlin? <laughs> I don't know who that is. <laughs> sure you do. <laughs> I, you know, I couldn't say that there's a, a role that, you know, I when I studied as an actor, I, I studied to be a character actor. I didn't study to be a leading man. And uh, I kind of got trapped in a leading man body. But I, I always try to draw on my, you know, who I am as an act, as a person to in the roles that I portray. But I also always try to create a character. Uh, so, you know, I don't know that the there was uh, maybe L.A. Law was the one that was closest to the vest because, uh, he was he was not much of a character, not too far away from who I am. That was kind of what I thought, that that, that role in L.A. Law, it felt like you weren't acting at all. It was just seemed like you were just you. Well, and that's the trick. That's what you want to do with all the characters. And even, even when I'm trying to play someone who's very broad, like what I'm doing now in, in Mayfair Witches, I also try to bring enough of me so it doesn't look like I'm acting. But, you know, that's that's the trick right there. That's the fine line that we all have to tread. Now, you've worked with your beautiful wife, Lisa, a number of times. You had a reality show in 2010 called Harry Loves Lisa, and you appeared together in The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, and you co-starred in the first season of Veronica Mars as Aaron and Lynn Eccles, and you made a TV movie called Sex, Lies, and Obsession. Do you have any future plans to work together? Well, we're talking about a few things right now that we might do together, but I can't let that cat out of the bag quite yet. But yeah, there's look, we love working together, and and uh, that movie that we did, Sex Lies and Obsession, was the first film about a s sex addiction, and and Lisa was, I think, six or seven months pregnant when we did that film and if you ever go back and see it again she's always got pillows or something in front of her belly because she was starting to show um, well i think you know that the world loves the two of you and i think it's would be great if the two of you did something again together and and whenever you are allowed to let the cat out of the bag i hope you'll give me the honor of coming back and talking about it well um hopefully it'll be something that 
that will reflect our values and and our family and how you know what what we put ahead of most other things put it that way Harry, you wrote in your book that your ambition as a young man to become a great actor was fueled by a feeling of inadequacy that came from a lack of parental encouragement and some very mean comments from your brother when you were growing up, to be quite blunt. Once you became successful, were you able to overcome those feelings of inadequacy? Yeah, no, without question. And I'm not so sure it had so much to do with success as just maturity i mean you know growing up and living uh amongst the rest of the world rather than your 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 little insular family uh but yeah i think we all as kids you know we're, we look i for I, I being the younger brother i looked at my older brother like he was a god you know and he he unfortunately took advantage of that and kind of exploited that but but uh, yeah i you know I would say, no, I don't. I didn't take much of that insecurity with me. I'm glad to hear that. You know, I want to remind you that on opening night of your very first professional acting job, which was the starring role in Equus, the director, Bill Ball, sent you a card that said, you have greatness within you. Did you ever show that card to your parents? No, I didn't. Why not? I... I don't know. I mean, they were not at that point. They were not really thrilled about me being an actor, uh, though they did come and see that play in which I spent about twenty minutes fully frontally nude in it. The um, though they, I, I think they thought it was. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what they thought, in fact, but but I did not show that to them, and it does it moves me when I think about that. He he wrote that note, and I still have that note pinned on the wall of my office. It's as much a reflection of him as it is of you, that he had that perception and he also had the generosity to give you that statement that you really needed at that time in your life. Well, I think as a young professional actor, and that was my first professional job, and it was actress, and I did have to be naked for a, well, too long on stage, put it that way. It was very cold in the theater. So... Uh, yeah, I think that that did go a long way to giving me the confidence to go on and pursue like a larger, bigger career. Yeah. Are you able to watch yourself on TV or in a movie and be able to assess your own performance objectively? That's a good question. I don't usually watch myself. So after I've done something, I don't usually go back and look at it. I I think I watched maybe one Mad Men with Lisa, one of the ones that I did, maybe the last one that I did, the show that I did. But and I did see 80 for Brady at the premiere for 80 for Brady, but I, I normally wouldn't have seen it. I don't, I don't really watch myself uh, unless I sort of stumble on it. Is that because you, you worry that you'll be overly critical? No, it's a waste of time. That's all. Um, I've already done it. I was there, I, uh, you know, and... Uh, I was in the midst of the experience in reality. So to take that time and, uh, you know, well, I think maybe I probably saw five LA laws over the ser series, you know, the time of that series. Uh, and there were a few reasons for that, not the least of which is that my wife at the time was on uh, another network at exactly the same time on another show. And so, you know, neither one of us watched either one of our shows. So, uh, Anyway, that was, but I just, I, I, not something that I'm, I'm drawn to do, you know. Well, you know, when I look at the synchronicity of how your career unfolded, I mean, the fact that you only took drama at Berkeley because you got to the registration desk so late that the environmental design courses were already full, and then the timing of the scholarship at the American Conservatory Theater, which came in the nick of time before you took a job at a TV station in New York, and so many other fortuitous circumstances in your life. Do you believe in destiny? No, I don't. There, I mean, I, I, I don't. No, I, 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 I am a scientist at heart, and I, I rely on the scientific method to to scan the world. 
but there has been a synchronicity. When I read your book and I look at your career, it feels like your career had a life of its own. Well, it, it did, mainly because I never, I don't do a five-year plan. In other words, I don't set goals for myself and then try to pursue them. I allow the world to unfold or around me or whatever. I mean, I, I know a lot of friends who are very, very successful who have these very strict plans of, I'm gonna, I've got a five-year plan, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And I just take life as it comes. And uh, I'm, I, I leave myself open to suggestion and open to opportunities as they come. And I found that if if we are open to opportunities and things that do, are, they're, they're around us, they're everywhere. I mean, if our eyes are open and we're living in the moment, then uh, the opportunities are manifest. They're everywhere. And then it's a question of manifesting them. But uh, I don't think that that destiny has much to do with it. I could be wrong, but I don't, I don't think so. Well, whatever it is, it's working. Now, you wrote a very unusual memoir because the book ends before you begin your film and television career. Do you have any plans to write another book that picks up where you left off? I, I I do. I I wrote a a one person play uh, a couple of years ago with a friend of mine who's who writes one person plays. He did uh, Carrie Fisher's Wishful Drinking, and we took that play to Delaware Theater Company and we did a workshop of it during COVID in the parking lot because the theater was closed, and and basically that play was uh was going to be for me kind of the outline for this next book of course the next book will not only deal with you know my relationships and a lot of other crazy stuff that happened after the end of the first book but it would also deal with fusion because the the uh you know i would say that my main focus for the last 30 years has been trying to shepherd this new technology and and successfully creating this company that now is a, a major going concern and, and the most advanced uh, anatronic fusion energy company in the world. So uh, that's been a big focus and that'll be a big part of the book as well. Well, that's really fascinating. You delivered a TED talk in 2016 entitled, You Don't Have to Be a Rocket Scientist to Be a Futurist, which was groundbreaking in terms of generating interest in anatronic fusion power. Where does this passion for creating safe, clean, accessible electricity come from? Uh, well, I just I, I've, I've been aware for the last 30 or 40 years that we've had environmental issues and we've had issues with fossil fuels, a lot of different kinds of issues. And it used to be, well, you know, we needed to be independent. We were dependent upon, you know, uh, OPEC and all that. So we needed to find a new energy source that we didn't, so we could use without having to use fossil fuels. Then it, then it became, you know, well, the ozone layer is in trouble. Then it became, well, there's this thing called global warming, and then it became climate change. And now we know that it's climate change. And so having all those things in mind, when I was presented with this idea, this new way to make electricity that was completely pollution-free and absolutely aneutronic, meaning no neutrons were produced, so it's radiation-free as well. When I was presented with that idea, I, I was like, "Well, somebody's got to follow this through," and so I did, and uh, and and just by happenstance was in a position to start this company in 1998, and 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 so did. Imagine how proud your father must be of you. <laughs> I guess we're always searching for our parents' approval, aren't we? And and uh, though they're they're long since gone, I, I imagine that he might be. You know, I, I never studied uh, any engineering or science, or he would have liked that. He would like he would like me to go to MIT, I think, which is where he went, but. I was if uh, if you read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book Outliers, in that he he describes you know how people of certain born in certain years ended up doing certain things, and that you know, I being born in the early fifties was sort of destined to be in the humanities, and people who were born nineteen fifty five and after were sort of destined to go into the whole computer world because they would have had computers in their high schools and they would have been able to to understand that whole side of the equation. But uh, I was, you know, 
I was lucky enough to be born before all that came about so I could pursue a, a, a career in the humanities. Well, wherever your dad is, I have a feeling he's smiling down on you and very proud of you, finally. Well, I hope so. <laughs> hey, Dad. Now, <laughs> you, dad. Have a, you have a cooking show coming out called In the Kitchen with Harry. Can you tell us anything about it? Well, I haven't shot it yet. But yes, AMC did offer me this cooking show. And we're just trying to figure out the timing. You know, we're on strike right now here in uh, Hollywood land and around the world for actors. I mean, the actors may go out too next week. But, you know, so the strike has created a lot of challenges scheduling wise for everybody. So we'll wait and see when that happens. Well, I'm looking forward to that. I didn't know you had culinary skills, but I'm anxious to watch them. I have really only one more question for you. It's kind of important. Are you ready? Okay, shoot. You drove a BMW, which you named Beulah, for 24 years. That car was an unforgettable character in your book. So I've got to ask you, whatever happened to Beulah? <laughs> I ended up giving Beulah to my, my assistant, who needed a car. And I... I had one day Beulah broke down when I was coming back from an acting class and I I walked across it just happened to break down across the street from the Porsche dealership and I had just made some dough doing a, a show called Space, James Michener's Space, and I had some had some dough in the bank and I just walked across the street and bought this Porsche Carrera. And then, you know, I ended up I got Beulah fixed up and I drove Go for around for a while more, but you know the when it was like you know BMW two thousand and two Porsche nine eleven. I mean, even though the the BMW two thousand and two, I still say was the best car I've ever driven. You know because of the, it handled so beautifully, and it was it was like nobody was buying BMWs. Nobody had even heard of BMWs when I bought that car. But a friend of mine who was very car conscious had said, you know, if you're going to get a car, you should get a BMW. So I did. <laughs> well, Harry, I know how very busy you are. I know you get a lot of requests for interviews, and I really appreciate you took the time to speak with me today. Thank you so much for appearing on our show. No, my pleasure. And I have to say, you know, you've done a very thorough job of going back, you know, and trying to figure out, you know, all the stuff that I've done and to read that book and do all that. I'm, I'm very pre appreciative of that, of doing that kind of research. Uh, it was a great pleasure. Our guest has been the wonderful Harry Hamlin. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my PR director, Laurie Towers, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.